This is One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Carberline. There are those who believe that life here began out there, perhaps even on Mars. On today's show, we have Dr. Roger Duby, physicist and director of the Science Exploration Program at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And he's going to talk about the possibilities of life on Mars. One of the things you're looking at right now is a recreation of the Miller experiment. Could you give me an overview of what that actually is? Sure. So it's the Miller and Urey experiment. Uh, Miller was the graduate student and Harold Urey was the professor. His first experiment was done in 1953. uh, And what he did was he postulated that perhaps he could recreate the primordial conditions of early Earth the ocean, its minerals, uh, the atmospheric components in the right ratio, and even lightning uh, with the evaporation and condensation cycle churning away. And uh, he wanted to see whether or not that process could create amino acids, proteins, long chain hydrocarbons uh, that could form the basis for life. Right, so this is sometimes called the origin of life experiment, the abiogenesis experiment. Right, Um, so they designed this experiment, they ran it for about a week, and they got this uh, purplish liquid at the end of it, uh, which has been affectionately called the primordial soup. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it had all kinds of amino acids and proteins uh, in in this, mixture after about a week of this process running. Um, Carl Sagan picked up on this experiment some years later uh, and decided that he was going to add the nuance of saying, well, lightning doesn't happen that often. uh, So let's go ahead and take a look at something that's present continuously on the early Earth, which is the ultraviolet light uh, from the sun. So those photons have enough uh, energy that they can actually break uh, molecular bonds and that allows the, the uh, molecules now to recombine and form different right. uh, molecules. You see that effect in like a plastic lawn furniture where it's, it's left out in the sun and it gets fragile and starts falling apart. Exactly, same, okay. same process. Uh, so he, he modified the experiment. Now he removed the electrical discharge for lightning and replaced it with ultraviolet light. He used long wavelength ultraviolet light, so 350 to about 400 nanometers wavelength. Okay. Um, and he ran the experiment for about a week uh, using the same uh, ratios of the early Earth's atmosphere gases and produced pretty much the same primordial soup. Voila. So that was really kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Um, What uh, my students are going to be doing is they're going to reproduce the second experiment, the Sagan experiment. Okay, so the ultraviolet light. And- they're going, we're going to use ultraviolet light simply because, to be honest, the idea of, of an arc spark inside a closed atmospheric chamber like that doesn't excite me very much. <laughs> um, I just would not like any unexpected events to happen right, with my students. Right, so right. we are going to not go that way. So we're going to reproduce early Earth using ultraviolet light. Uh, get that experiment running. And then uh, the thing that has not yet been done uh, is to now go to uh, the early conditions on Mars. Uh, okay. In about the four billion years ago time frame, uh, the Earth and Mars, in fact, all of the uh, uh, solar planets were uh, going through what was called the heavy bombardment right. age. That's where lots there were of meteors lots and, and lots of meteors and asteroids and basically everything from the formation of the solar system was settling out uh, and the things that had eccentric orbits were slowly getting you know weaned out and 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 collected by the remaining planets and so mm-hmm. the poor planets were getting clobbered all the time uh, and so uh, we're picking that time frame uh, and there's a specific reason that we're doing that uh, and that is that there's a theory called panspermia right Uh, And the idea there is that uh, perhaps life originated on Mars, uh, and perhaps uh, with life on the surface of Mars, perhaps an asteroid came in, struck the planet very violently, all sorts of ejecta got sent out into the interplanetary region, and after some period of time, maybe 50, 100,000 years later or longer, uh, one of these asteroids might come down uh, as a meteor on Earth, you know, arrive in the ocean and basically release its amino acids and proteins into the Earth's uh, ocean and bingo. Now you've got the seeding of 
life on Earth by something that happened on another planet. Right. So that's the theory of panspermia. Okay. So what our and students... And we have, we have evidence of meteorites reaching the Earth from Oh, Earth. yes, so absolutely. At least that part of it oh, yeah. is absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Okay. So, so um, a little bit of a sidetrack here. Uh, last year's experiment, not this Miller experiment, uh, was indeed searching for signs of life on Mars meteorites. Okay. Uh, so you and actually got to have a, so a Mars meteorite. So we got and... seven Mars meteorites in hand. and Fragments. Or... They're, they're yeah. small pieces. Okay. Um, and the, the first question that I had the students answer was, well, how do we even know these things are from Mars? Very first question, right? It's like, how do, how, why isn't this just a chunk of rock from, that somebody picked up in Colorado somewhere? Yep. And the answer is that if you look at the ratio of uh, two isotopes of argon, argon-36 and argon-38, okay. on Earth, that ratio is about 1.2 to 1. Uh, and what happens is the heavier isotope gets formed by the b bombardment of uh, argon by cosmic rays. Okay. Because the Earth has a very thick atmosphere, the cosmic rays are severely attenuated compared to the environment on Mars. Okay. They have a very thin atmosphere, and there the ratio of the same two isotopes is 3.4 to 1. So we actually know the ratio of argon. Significantly different. Yes, and it's and very And so different. all you have to do is take a look at that ratio of those isotopes, and bingo, you can right. tell whether or not it's Earth- uh, based or if it's Martian. And because it's argon, it's a noble gas. It's, it doesn't interact stable, with things. It doesn't so, interact so, with things. So it just so that's it it. captures this snapshot and then you're good to go. So it's just that easy. So it's that easy. So we were able to validate the, that ratio with our early Mars rovers. Indeed, 3.4 to 1. It's like, wow, okay. really, really nice really stuff. Really higher, yeah. Yeah. So so going back to, to uh, Miller and Yuri, we are looking at that early Martian environment. I have the students now looking at uh, the atmospheric components and their ratios in that time frame uh, on Mars. I have another group of students looking at the intensity of uh, the solar spectrum on early Mars. Uh, so they have to look at the aging of the sun and see how okay. that affects it. They have to worry about the attenuation of the light from the sun by the Martian atmosphere at that time. So right. it's a so pretty. It's not just how much sunlight is reaching Mars, yeah. but how much is getting through the atmosphere, which is yeah. different. Getting parts. through the atmosphere and and at that particular wavelength in particular, because we want to reproduce how much UV uh, was hitting the surface right. of Mars. So when you're talking about the difference between the early conditions of Earth and the early conditions of Mars, how do they differ? There's a huge difference uh, in terms of atmospheric components and their ratios. Okay. Uh, in that time frame, during the early bombardment period, Mars was about 92% CO2. Okay. And the other components, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, you know, water vapor, were way down in this single maybe couple of percent. Right. And so then Earth was... Earth, in complete contrast, was more like... 20% oxygen, 20% nitrogen, 20% CO2. You know, so, so those are really big differences right, right. of atmospheric conditions. Uh, so it'll be kind of interesting to see <clears throat> whether or not we, we see the same type of uh, primordial soup being created on early Mars. Right. Um, it seems like, if, if I remember the, the Earth experiment, it was the ammonia and the... Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the nitrogen compounds as yes. well as the carbon compounds right. that allow the ammonia acids to form. And if you've got mostly CO2, right. it yep. would seem like it might be very much That's harder right. to do. Right, exactly. But, you know, keep in mind that uh, early Mars, like early Earth, did have uh, active water on the okay. surface. And so that dissolved a lot of the minerals. We know what the mineral content of Mars is now, especially since we have these meteorites in hand. So we can actually reproduce that pretty well. Okay, so we um, know pretty well then what the early condition was of mm -hmm, Mars and the early mm -hmm. condition. Of yeah. Uh, Mars was a lot warmer then than it is now. Uh, it had a thicker atmosphere then than now. Um, temperatures on the surface of Mars ranged from about 10 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to, uh, you know, probably on the order of 80 degrees or so Fahrenheit. So it would be... Uh, so human human lot, livable conditions. Very human in terms livable of conditions. Yeah. I mean, even now with our rovers, we do see clouds going by on Mars. Right. So, you know, it's got this it's got a lot of the characteristics that we think, you know, wow, that, that really reminds me of home. Mm -hmm. uh, except the sky is pink and not blue. <laughs> right. right. Um, but uh, with 
<clears throat> with all of that, um, the early Earth conditions, in contrast, Earth was much, much hotter at that time. Temperatures of 110 degrees at the coolest point. I know it's warm now. This has been right. a warm summer for us. But, Basically summer in Texas. Summer in Phoenix around. or something like that. <laughs> and that's kind of like the cool part of the planet. Right, And then it right. just gets you're, hotter you're from there the when you get to the equator. Like southern Texas. Uh, so those conditions have changed significantly. And right. of course, with those kinds of temperatures on both planets, there's a lot of uh, thermal activity. So there's a lot of other mixing uh, things happening, not just right. the UV breaking the bonds. Now, were those warmer temperatures? Was that was was that driven by the sun, or was that because of their atmospheres being thicker? Or uh, well, actually, there was also so it's a whole combination of things, uh, and and certainly those two are true. There was also a lot more volcanic activity okay. uh, on, on both, Mars, on both on Mars, both and Earth and Mars, okay. uh, that that dramatically changed uh, what the planet felt like. We had some serious asteroid hits that uh, basically put a lot of uh, stuff into the atmosphere uh, and, and gave us more of a greenhouse effect type of thing. We had periods of rapid cooling and then heating back up. The same types of things were experienced on, on Mars. Um, okay, so very volatile and rapid changes yeah, and everything. Absolutely, so absolutely. It doesn't sound like a good environment for life. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, not certainly not the way we know it now, Yeah. but it was yeah. perhaps as a crucible of life, it was just really what, what was needed, and that's what we're trying to investigate. You're listening to One Universe at a Time. I'm talking to Roger Duby about the possibilities of life on Mars. So you mentioned working with students, mm -hmm. and, and so you have students working on this project. Are these graduate students? Are they undergrads? So these are actually incoming first-year students. So these are fresh freshmen. These are, these are fresh freshmen. They have not completed a single course at RIT when they walk into this project. You're bold. <laughs> <laughs> but the exciting thing is that suddenly their, their creative uh, and scientific curiosity is unleashed with all of the facilities that we have available to them with all of the faculty, staff, and graduate students that are around here, they learn very quickly that they can make tons of progress if they learn how to tap those resources very effectively. Right, that uh, would seem like a huge challenge because you're basically taking high school students and, and putting them on what is a replication of a Nobel Prize winning experiment. That's correct, that's right. And as I say, none of them have taken a, a, a complete RIT course yet. They don't walk in with a pre-existing knowledge of organic chemistry or physical chemistry or any of those uh, types of things. They don't have a good feeling for uh, even the imaging science part of, of the experiments. Are, um, these, are these majors? Are they chemistry majors or physics majors? Or This particular class, uh, science exploration, is for students who are interested in the science sciences or mathematics, but they haven't chosen a major yet. So these are undeclared students coming into RIT. They like science, but they, they don't know what. They love science, but they're not sure what. So they've had science in high school, right? but they just they don't Correct. know what to commit to or if That's they want to right. commit to. What I try to do in this course is expose them to what real science is like. Here's the goal. Now you have to tell me how you're going to get there. Right. Uh, and I will provide the support, I'll provide the equipment, the instrumentation, I'll make suggestions, maybe you should go speak with this professor of astrophysics, etc. Uh, but by and large, I want them to learn how to direct research as a group. So they're developing their own program in terms of they're how to carry this out. developing their own program. So you and say, I, okay, we want to do mm -hmm. this experiment. That's correct. And go forth. Right. And you're just kind there of as a go. mentor. And I'm there to make sure that, you know, they don't do anything <laughs> crazy, that they pr stay within some reasonable bounds. Right. I do make suggestions from time to time, but I try not to uh, do that too much because it interferes with the creative process. I want them to really learn how to work together, uh, how to organize a project as part of the team, uh, and uh, how to take responsibility for what each of the groups does uh, in contributing to the whole project, because it's a multifaceted mm -hmm. project. So how many years have you done this? So we've done this now, this is our fourth year uh, is in this incarnation of science exploration. Okay. Um, previously, uh, it had been kind of a survey course where, you know, we would bring in speakers, they would talk about their research in this field and that field. So they'd learn Someday about- Someday you too may do right. this. <laughs> this is what biology is like. This is what astronomy is like and so on. And so they'd, they'd get to hear and engage these, these professors and researchers 
but there was no hands-on component. Right. And I, I'm an experimentalist, and so I sort of look at the world as like, I want to be able to actually do something. If I can't put my hands on it, it's That's not real. That's right. <laughs> so I, want, I wanted to create an environment where they would have that opportunity to really get involved, if they so chose. If they find that they just can't stand literally getting their hands dirty, maybe they can do the calculations. Okay. You know, maybe that's, they're more comfortable with that. I mean, there are, you know, two classes of scientists. There are theorists and there are experimentalists. Right. And right. both of them are perfectly valid. And it really depends on the nature of the person to sort of discover, gee, I really like the theory or I really like building things. You know, mm-hmm. and they have to discover that about themselves. Then they have to discover which of the many aspects of science within the College of Science and Mathematics uh, really excite them, the, one, the things that they feel really engaged about. And that's what the course tries to offer. I choose projects that are multifaceted and preferably touching on all of the sciences. Uh, right, so a thing there. like this one that would go like into chemistry one. and physics <laughs> and imaging science, mm-hmm. computer modeling, all of those yeah, types all of, of those things. things. Yeah, okay. that's absolutely right. So, so about how many students are working on this? So this year we have uh, 18 students in the class. Um, the number kind of goes up and down. What's happening is that there's some networking going on and sort of the word is getting out that this is a really interesting course. I'll um, sign up. <laughs> <laughs> I've had, so I, I give these presentations where I talk about this program to uh, prospective students and their parents. And the majority of the comments that I get afterwards are from the parents saying, I really want to come back to college and take this course. Right, right. Because it's, it's just an, ex- it's exactly the way I would have loved to do it as an undergrad myself. Right. Uh, to have that opportunity. Well, just to jump right in. To jump right in, absolutely. Right. And, and you learn things by necessity rather than by program. So it's not rote. It's not, you know, at the end of this course, you'll understand what quantum mechanics is. Rather, they have to get in there and sort of, you know, do some studying about quantum mechanics right away so that they understand how photons interact with matter uh, and how they might break those chemical bonds. Right. Uh, as opposed to taking the entire... Uh, quantum mechanics. So it's not comprehensive in the sense that the, you know, it's not, not it, but, it's, but they're getting a very specific thing in, in that area, which right. is a lot like how we do research. It's it is. That kind it's of just in time totally learning. How we, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. And the other thing that's really fun about this um, type of approach is that the students get to experience surprises and they get to experience disappointment. Mm-hmm. You know, gee, I really thought we were going to find this and it didn't happen that way. Uh, My experiment didn't work the way I thought it was going to work. But then, you know, they have to learn critical thinking. What exactly did the experiment do? How could it have done that? What is that telling you? It's telling you something about an underlying process where you perhaps had made some assumptions that aren't quite right. Mm -hmm. So what are you learning from this? And they sort of learn that process Again, in a very hands-on sort of way. Right. So whether the experiment is a success, quote unquote, or a failure, doesn't matter, right? Because you're focused on the su- make, giving the experience for the students. Correct. You know, yeah. sometimes a failure is a success. The success here is the students being engaged and learning how right. to think critically. Uh, the specifics of, you know, gee, did you make anything that was whiz bang at the end? Is secondary. Right. Uh, you know, right. obviously, we want them to succeed and. You know, in years past, we've had some very nice successes with this class, but but that's not really what I'm looking for. I'm just giving them something really juicy <laughs> to bite into, you know, the right. ultimate cheeseburger. That's um, right. And then they, they can actually go and explore that. Exactly. So that sounds like a huge challenge. Yeah. This is One Universe at a Time. We're talking with Roger Doobie about the origins of life on Mars. Obviously, you want to be a success with this. I mean, mm-hmm. Miller and no, Yuri. Yuri. Miller mm-hmm. and Yuri wanted to be a, a success. Is this always one of those big questions? It's like the Big Bang or evolution or anything like that. This idea of abiogenesis, the arisal of life from inanimate stuff. It's, I guess one of the questions I would have is, why do we explore this? What do we want to find from this? We're really trying to extend our understanding of who we are, why we're here, and how we got here. And there are many different ways to tackle that. I mean, clearly a lot of different uh, fields of human endeavor involve things like philosophy and psychology and and, and the sciences and so on. Uh, And each of them is really kind of trying to tackle that question. 
you know, who are we? How did we get here? What are we doing? What is our purpose in life? So really, this is one of those incarnations. It's like, you know, wow, just just from a nuts and bolts point of view, how do you start with a bunch of uh, very uninteresting uh, chemicals and end up with something that reproduces itself and can mutate and right. can further improve itself? That's, that's a really fascinating thing. If you can jumpstart that uh, and now start... Uh, creating an organism that will be able to replicate uh, and be able to absorb a mutation and actually change and improve over time, or die, mm -hmm. as the case. Or dies. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we know the, the the kind of the origins of the early molecules in living organisms, mm -hmm. and we know kind of the building blocks that right. were around, possibly on Earth and Mars, but also in space. Right. And it's really kind of connecting those two dots. Yeah. One of the really interesting little things that popped out of the original Miller and Urey experiment is the chirality of the long chain hydrocarbons. Right. So the chirality is basically, uh, if you think of things such as a right-handed or a left-handed screw, right. uh, that is basically a chirality. Right. Uh, so and your it, right hand goes one way, left hand goes the other way, and that's why we call them right and left-handed. Exactly. And the DNA molecule has a chirality to it. And right. it, it's interesting that, you know, all living things on Earth, with very, very rare exceptions, have a particular handedness, a chirality to them. Right. Uh, and the other chirality is virtually not present. Right. One of the things that popped out of the Miller and Urey experiment, and was again reproduced by the, the later studies, uh, demonstrated that when you run this experiment the way that it's been conceived, you end up with an equal population of both chiralities. Right. So there's something that happened that we don't understand yet. That it selected one selected from the other. Selected for one and, and really minimized the presence of the other. It's hypothesized that if you were to go to a planet uh, and the population of uh, species on that planet were the opposite chirality of DNA, that we would have difficulty digesting uh, or even using right. uh, the material that we were busy ingesting from right. those, those Wasn't there Wasn't things. there something like an artificial sugar that was supposed to be yes, great, but exactly. then we couldn't taste it either because <laughs> it was exactly like tasted right. like flour? Like, yeah, that's, <laughs> exa that's exactly right. And so so there's a real consequence to that, and, and we do not yet understand what the selection mechanism was. So there, right. there's, there's a mystery that still exists there. Right. There are probably many mysteries that still exist uh, related to that experiment. That, that one is a, a glaring problem. It's like, okay, uh, we don't see an equal population of the two chiralities on Earth. How did we get where we are? What could possibly have happened that would cause one to dominate over the other? And we don't have the answer to that. Could that be random unknown. chance, could be... That's something right. where one one handedness is actually better than the other mm -hmm. it would seem odd. Or it, it, I mean, it could be that because one uh, chirality uh, favored the uh, genesis of living organisms that then reproduced and populated, perhaps they favored the chirality because it was something they could digest and reuse. And the other chiralities were left alone. They never evolved into anything. And so that population just stayed stagnant. Right. Perhaps it's something like that. We don't know yet. Um, and we see similar things with like, um, what is it, anaerobic bacteria versus aerobic bacteria. Mm -hmm. Once the oxygen levels came up, then one became very rare. Yep. And the other one became very common. That's correct. So right. it could be a similar thing like that. Early on, they were kind of equal. And then for right. whatever reason, one had an advantage. Right. I'm actually looking forward to this movie, Martian, mm -hmm. um, because we have Matt Damon on the surface of Mars, and he's in this you know little tent thing, and he, he there's there's a, a scene in the trailer where they show this this little bean sprout or something growing out of the Martian soil, and I'm watching this and I'm thinking, uh, so let's see, where's the carbon that this is getting? You know, yeah, I, I, I'm sort of missing something here. That thing should be having a great deal of difficulty. <laughs> Uh, right. Being able to grow. Well, that's so. what happens when you try and write a science fiction book. Everybody who knows stuff starts right. picking it apart. Well, I know. And that, <laughs> my wife hates that about about going to a science fiction movie with me because I just tear the thing apart and then she walks away feeling <laughs> completely unsatisfied because I just ruined it for her. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but it's, it, it almost seems like, you know, related to that, it, it's one of the controversies that people have about scientists in general. You know, that there, there seems to be a kind of magic to, to the existence of life. 
mm-hmm. and that well, if you're gonna if you're gonna look at the origins of life, you're kind of destroying that. You, you're just kind of the the naysayer that's gonna pick it apart and go, well, it's just chemistry on Mars, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Uh, and and there, of course, there's there's a a line uh, between the pure science and sort of the spiritual side of the world, mm-hmm. um, and that's something where. We don't have a good way to define where that edge is. We don't know how to cross the edge and move into the spiritual world to understand, okay, well, maybe the chemistry is happening, but is it really alive? Is it really self-aware? Right. Does it know that it's alive and that it's going to reproduce and have offspring? These are all total mysteries that are way beyond you know, just the initial scope of this type of experiment. But clearly, something happened. Uh, mm-hmm. And the origin of that little spark of, of spirit is a complete mystery. Right. That we don't have even, as scientists, we don't have even an inkling of We don't have a way to contextualize is. it much less. We can't even contextualize it. We don't, we don't speak that language yet. But even so. if you feel like you're dancing on the edge, you think it's still worth exploring the questions and, oh, yeah. and doing I, these types of experiments? I, I, I believe so very much um, because it allows us to address the fundamental question are we alone in the universe? I mean, we've got all these exoplanets now that we're discovering at a very rapid rate, and they're all within the Goldilocks zone. Everything's just right uh, for the origin of life. And so if we can reproduce the conditions that produced the uh, fundamental building blocks of life here, then we'll know with reasonable confidence that could happen on these other types of planets. Right. And we could even reproduce those conditions once we know a bit right. more. Once we know what those planets are, we could do, we can know, do the same experiment again. We'll planet Alpha Ceti C, Boom. okay, let's and do it here. Exactly. Okay. So it, it provides kind of like a, a Lego building block kind of set of, of toys that we can play with to try things out and see whether or not we can get things to work uh, in mm-hmm. a similar way and answer the question, well, what's the probability that there may actually be something there? Uh, could it have evolved uh, to something as intelligent as we are, able to communicate across interstellar space and, and so on? It seems like, I, I think it was Carl Sagan who said, you know, either we're alone in the universe or we're not. And either answer to that question is profound. Oh, yes. Absolutely. We've been talking with Dr. Roger Doobie, physicist and director of science exploration program at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Our program is produced by Mark Gillespie at RIT with support from the RIT College of Science. Thanks for listening to One Universe at a Time. Mm-hmm.